All right, we are officially in the PM here in the entire continental United States, so we are going to get started. It was absolutely clear skies here in Michigan yesterday for that exciting solar eclipse, but today we are going to talk about clouds, thankfully. So I want to welcome you and uh, appreciate your attendance today. I am going to really kind of walk you through where we've come over my career here. And uh, I got to start a long time ago, really just when we were just little old SolidWorks, but we've become this massive ecosystem. And uh, it's really kind of exciting where these products have grown to. And, uh, you know, made the world a little bit smaller all as a result of that. So let's go ahead and kind of get started a little bit with what we're talking about today. Now, we're talking about specifically what is going on with 3D Experience and SolidWorks with cloud services. And uh, there's a couple of different ways that SolidWorks has delivered these days. Cloud services as being the part of your existing desktop licenses. But I want to go ahead and kind of start from the beginning, just so everybody is super clear as to what we're talking about today, by talking a little bit about the basics of what is 3D Experience. Um, this message is one that can't be expressed enough. And the more you hear it, the more you really understand just the power and magnitude that we have at our hands. Now, SolidWorks with cloud services is really the core of what we're going to talk about today. And along with that, we're really going to get into the things that all of you really have available to you, at least over the last nine months, which is when this information really became reality to the, to the user base. So very important um, that you understand what you maybe already don't know that you have in your hands. And then we're going to talk about where this goes. The 3D experience platform and what we're going to talk about today is really literally just dipping our toe in the water. It has the ability to really let you choose your own adventure and really adjust your, um, you know, data acquisition and, and, and uh, you know, dispersal throughout your company by having one source of it all, but everybody in their different silos having access to it. And I want to give you a couple of ideas of where that should go in the short term and give you, again, a chance to grow as you need to. And then we'll do some questions at the end, which you can also do over on the right hand side of our interface. There is a chat and a question and answer area. Both of those are available to us and we'll be monitoring that as we go. We're also recording this. So anybody that you know that didn't have a chance to see this, we'll be able to let them see this at a later time. All right, let's get moving. So first, what is 3D experience? Now the 3D experience platform has a big marketing push behind it. But what it really comes down to is a single source of the truth for everybody within the organization. And I literally mean everybody. It is scalable from the single mom and pop who just wants to have cloud storage and security of their data to anybody dispersed throughout the world that has access to an internet connection and in all disciplines within even the most diverse company. So we are going to start really by talking about it in a technical standpoint by what is the 3D experience from a user interface standpoint. Now, it is available in what we refer to as both a cloud and hybrid cloud. Now, to really discuss that, it comes down to access and what your role happens to be within your company. Now, access through the cloud is through browsers, and it's browser independent, which means OS independent. And that's very, very important. Um, there are dedicated tools that only exist within browsers. So that would be the part of it, which would be full on cloud only. Now, there are people within the organization that maybe don't create data using CAD tools, but they definitely have to do their part within the organization to move those parts that have been designed along in the process, whether it comes to material acquisition or sending it out for machining and quotes and bids um, to organizing the entire package before it goes out the back of the shop. And those are the things that we need to have those individuals within our company to have their access to. They don't need SolidWorks, but they do need access to all the data that SolidWorks creates. Now, we also talk about hybrid cloud, and this is where things get very interesting. It connects to our locally installed applications. Now, SolidWorks, regardless of what terminology you hear out there on the web, is a locally installed software, whether we're talking 3D Experience SolidWorks or traditional SolidWorks desktop that's been available since mid 90s. It is locally installed through and through. The difference is, is today we're talking about how desktop SolidWorks now has access to storage and data and data management on the cloud, where 3D Experience SolidWorks, though it still installs locally, already has this access just by nature of it already being a platform-based and licensed tool. So either way, we're talking about SolidWorks installed locally using your processor, your RAM, your video card, all your suite bus speed, everything here running as it should, and then, the cloud itself is a repository. We save data to and 
pull data from that place. So that's what we're really talking about um, overall with a 3D experience in more or less just a technology standpoint. That's where SolidWorks comes in. Now, SolidWorks has been a subsidiary, a wholly owned company of Dassault Systems since 1997. So it's been a good 27 years of that. And that's really what we're going to talk about, focus most on um, where my ecosystem comes in. But the reality is Dassault Systems is massive. And we have a bunch of different sister products and different verticals that really suit everybody else within the most complex organization. Whether it's our sister CAD product, their Katia, Inovia, which we're going to be talking about a little bit today. That's our data management and PLM tools. And then there's Delmia and Simulia, high-end simulation on the cloud and manufacturing tools, robot programming and machining. Very, very awesome portfolio of what's available to us. And there's seven other brands that aren't even listed here that are just as uh, mature and, uh, and, and useful as these. So we're going to kind of keep it straight today. But we are, regardless of what we're talking about, the 3D experience platform is the center, the hub. It's where the data goes from any of these places and gets pulled to any of these places from whoever needs to do what with that data. It really does become that one-stop shop regardless of what we're talking about data-wise. Now, for our experience today, like I said, we're going to be talking about what reality is, is Anovia, and that's going to be the cloud services, which up to and includes data management right off the get. However, we're really just talking about a sliver of Anovia when the reality hits. is uh, It is really an incredibly scalable and massive tool um, that allows us to go really where we want to as far as what we do with our data, who accesses it, how we push it forward again through our organization. So today, again, we're going to focus just on these two components. So that is 3D Experience 101, and you're going to hear that message more and more. Um, again, you can't hear it enough, but what it is, is it's all the things that you need to be able to do in one location for whatever your role happens to be in the company. And again, I'll expound upon that even a little bit more. But next, we're going to talk about specifically SolidWorks with cloud services. Now, SolidWorks with cloud services, really, at a very simple aspect, is really data management on the cloud. Um, SolidWorks has had data management tools, whether it's solution partners or um, built-in corporate tools, things like SolidWorks PDM and Professional and Standard, um, or way back in the day with PDM Workgroup. Now, those are locally installed tools, but what we're talking about here is the cloud, the virtual space, those computers that are out there that you don't have to be responsible for, but are there and accessible anywhere you have an internet connection. Now, historically, PDM has been, like I aforementioned, it's been one of those things where it is a real heavy IT resource intense product. It's locally installed, it requires servers, it requires secure access to those servers through ports and people who know how to open them and do it securely. Um, and in a lot of cases, when we're talking about distributed workforces, we're getting into VPNs, which again, isn't something that just the guy who knows most about computers at your company is very good at doing, or at least doing properly. And you're responsible for everything. Those servers go down, you better have backups. You got to make sure they're scheduled. You got to make sure that everything is set. That's PDM in a nutshell. It does require people who know what they're doing and hardware that can handle everybody's data and everybody's access simultaneously. When we get into 3D experience, we're really taking this to a, a very light user experience as far as uh, administration and IT goes. There is no locally installed IT resource necessary for this. Um, and I mean servers, I mean on-site users that have to administrate this. Um, and access and everything is, again, there wherever you have an internet connection. Now, this might seem like a little pie in the sky here, but I do literally refer to this as data management on day one. The moment we get your sidebar installed and we get your collaborative designer into your desktop SolidWorks, which is your access to your cloud tools and PDM, you are saving to the platform using revision schemes and you have data management from that day. It's amazing. It's amazing. And licensing is very focused. You really only buy exactly what you need for every individual in your company, not bundles that have more tools than you need out of convenience of licensing, but really have you more buying things you don't necessarily use. So that's what we see a lot with the 3D Experience platform. Now I want to show you a little bit about what we're talking about here with data management on the cloud. So let's go ahead and get into SolidWorks. Okay, I'm going to open a little data set here that we've been using for a while. It's a little jigsaw that I've got sitting on my desktop. And it's going to be for a lot of users who have been PDM naked for a while. You have a lot of data locally um, or on network drives. So kind of just to verify this, let's just go up and show you the file references here real quick. 
And then I can show you that this is really just literally sitting on my C drive. Again, the experience that a lot of people who haven't used data management up to this point have been, but have a load of data created. Now, the interface for data management is very similar to what we've seen in a lot of other tools. We have tabs over in our task pane, and we can pin this in place and really get a lot of the feedback and interaction we need right here from within SolidWorks. Now, there are hieroglyphics in this. There is feedback when we select things, so it's bi-directional, very nice, very simple there. And it's going to show you really the status of the data that we have on screen and how to interact with that. Now, this little sidebar here is much like your locally installed desktop PDM, for those of you who have used any of those tools over again the last 15 or 20 years that we've had those available. Once again, though, this connects us to the cloud location, a repository that, once again, you're not responsible for. It's backed up, it's reliable, and it's accessible anywhere that you have a computer on the internet. Now, with the data that we're looking at right now, it lets us know with these hieroglyphics what the status is. And like I said, this stuff hasn't yet been updated and placed up on the platform. So in order to go ahead and put this in a repository, we're just going to focus a little bit here. And I'd like to do things that aren't really magical, um, auto magic. I kind of want to be deliberate and show you this. So I'm going to right click on this subassembly. We're going to say save with options. Now, what we get is a little bit of feedback as to, first of all, this data is new going up to the platform. And I have a setting where I have a default bookmark that I use for my 3D Experience World presentations. Now, bookmarks are a tool a tool, one tool that we use on the platform that gives us more of a Windows-esque type navigation and that comfort zone for people that are transitioning from drilling down into deep folders constantly and having that be the way, again, feels comfortable, but when you think about it, it really isn't efficient, to having a way to find their data, um, again, that's in a comfortable type of way. The reality is, is if you know anything anything at all about your files, you can find them using just our search tools. So we really try to foster the uh, the transition in a comfortable way using bookmarks. But the reality is, is that these are just one of many ways to locate your data on the platform. Now, when I go ahead and update this and load it up to the platform, once again, it's going to push it. I'm not working live across the internet here. I'm simply copying my data to a repository. That data is going to have a status and access for people who have security and rights to it. And then from there, the people who need to get that data will copy copies to their local computers to do what they need to do. It's safe, it's secure, and it's not constant pinging of the internet as a result of this. Now, what I see is the update of the status. It let's me know that this data now exists on the platform, and it's currently the latest and greatest data just based on my hieroglyphics. Uh, let's us know a few other things that we've got over here. Now, I'm going to open it in its own window just to give you a little bit more uh, focus on this. And we're going to go and just kind of click on a few different things that are over there. Now, the lock lets us know who has ownership of data like this. This is read-write access. It's a very simple concept, but super, super powerful for those of you who have lived in a Windows environment where last in wins, and every time you hit save, you're overwriting everything you've ever done with data. Those aren't really, again, the most convenient and efficient ways to deal with what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, with this, we can go ahead and kind of work in a way that's pretty obvious and pretty, you know, straight flowing. We've got latest and greatest data. We've got data that's got some other things, properties like where it's stored and, and descriptions and other metadata. And also the status or our maturity state, which those of you have used desktop SOLIDWORKS, this would be like the workflow, which gives us even another subset of the ability to secure the data based on who can see this, whether it's in work, in process, frozen or released. Those kinds of things are great ways um, to, again, ensure that people see the right data at the right time. Now, if I know that I'm going to work on a file, I right-click on it and I say lock. Nobody else has this file open, again, based on what I see there. And this gives me the ability to take ownership of the data. Now, you can call this check-in and check-out. You can call it taking, you know, lock, lock and unlock. Um, there's a lot of different terminologies that are used for this. But we now have right access to this. And anybody that has literal permissions to this data can use it, but only in a read-only capacity at this point. They would actually see a red lock icon there. All right, we're going to make a change. Now, this isn't a SOLIDWORKS demo, so let me just go in here and quickly just edit this dimension. And that way, this part of this part is just going to hang out the side of the uh, jigsaw when we go do our update. Now, this is also magical. First of all, the dirty flag is triggered. We changed a part, which means it now shows us that this file is different. But this data management, like SOLIDWORKS Desktop, is CAD aware. Very important. Unlike just a sharing or syncing drive tool like a Google Drive or a OneDrive, this understands that not only has a part changed, but the assembly that contains that part has also changed as a derivative of that. Now, I didn't take ownership of that assembly. Maybe I just didn't anticipate that needed to be changed. 
no big deal. You don't have to work in a perfectly linear type of manner. When I go to check in this data on the web, it's gonna let me do a couple of things here. First of all, the modified data here, well, I wanna go ahead and check that in, but I don't necessarily wanna overwrite the current revision, something I currently have permissions to be able to do. So what I wanna do on this is just trigger it to make a new revision. Now I didn't lock the assembly. So what I wanna do is go ahead and do that. And then kind of in the same respect, I don't wanna overwrite revision A with this change. I actually wanna go ahead and take ownership of the assembly and we're gonna go ahead and trigger a new revision on that as well. Okay, great. Let's just go ahead and save that. And my hieroglyphics are gonna change again to let us know that it's no longer revision A of a part and the assembly, but now those are revision B. The two parts that didn't change, there was no need to copy and transfer those back to the web because they didn't change. So we've now captured a historical change within this file through a very, very simple process. Okay, one of the greatest things about SOLIDWORKS is that when you make a change to a file, it changes everywhere. But the reality of that is, is we do a lot of mental gymnastics and copying and, and changing of folder names and ways to kind of hide and mask and segregate the data from each other so that that actually doesn't happen all the time. Well, data management is actually the way that you can control your destiny when it comes to data just updating out from under you because somebody else changed it. Now, what we're looking at gives us that historical layering simply by right-clicking on, in this case, our assembly and choosing a previous revision. Now, this isn't gonna be the, the most rich looking interface because I've only done this twice. So we have our current and one previous revision. But if I go back to revision A, you'll see not only the geometry backdates, but also in our tree, we're gonna see that the data is no longer the latest revision. Now that is neither good, bad, nor indifferent. It is simple historical fact. And data that you have shipped to a customer a few years ago will not look the same as the data as you've evolved it over the last few years. So we need to be able to open an assembly up in the built state it was back then, which means the old versions of those files the way they were back then. And this facilitates having those historical points in the sand from release data that you ship to a customer to easily right click and going back to that top level revision and having all of the backdated parts, everything beneath it look exactly the way it was when it was shipped. Really, really super powerful stuff and it's just a right click away. Now I'm gonna go back into that assembly. Like I said, you control your own destiny here. So instead of this data just updating out from under the other person working on this, I have the ability to proactively and when I want to check my notification, see that this file has been updated and either choose to refresh it to the latest version then, or whenever I feel like it, just proactively looking at that data and maybe updating it to the latest revision. Again, a right click away, we simply go down into the new revision and just get the latest. Simple stuff. Now we used to have to squirrel data away, change the file names, do a lot of different things in order to, to house these different revisions away. It's just not the case with data management involved. It does it as part of the natural flow of this process. Now, one last thing I wanna do with this is check the maturity state. Like I said, for those of you who have used desktop PDM, workflows is kind of the easiest parallel for this. This enables me to actually set it to a state which people can view it but not edit it and maybe wait for more of a formal review process in order to deal with that. When it comes down to it though, this tool is going to stop last in wins mentalities when multiple people have their hands in the data set. And at that point, you know, it's going to go ahead and give you those different revisions to be able to go back to when the idea that you had that maybe sounded good doesn't necessarily pan out. Now I'm going to move over here to the web. This would be the browser interface. Now, the browser is really more of a, a tool that you can set up an interface at your convenience based on what you need to do. I launch my SOLIDWORKS from here. This is where SOLIDWORKS Connected um, is licensed from. But when you're dealing with the data, now you're launching other little apps that access, like the bookmark tool, viewers to be able to view and mark up for those users who don't necessarily have CAD. And that's what the browser-based tools are really going to enable within your organization is those peripheral people who don't need a CAD license nor have the skills to run it to still be able to do everything they need to do and access the data and move it along in your process. Now, we build these interfaces uh, so that they really serve a task. Um, it's made up of these dashboards that have simple tabs. And I create a new tab by simply clicking new tab. And then based on what tabs or excuse me, what um, roles that you have assigned to you, you have the ability to simply go ahead and drag these out and create an interface that's consistent and convenient for you. 
So I'm going to go ahead and use my bookmarks. I'm going to grab a little viewer window in there. And then again, the ability to go ahead and change the, uh, the workflow state or our, our maturity state in our case. Now, using these tools, once again, is something that somebody in SolidWorks can do, but people without SolidWorks don't necessarily have access. So here we give you a rich set of tools to be able to work on the same data sets on the platform, which means unified information, the ability to comment, to interact, to mark up within this data set, and have all of that data stored within this file so that we all get to see it. Now, these viewers don't take a large skill set. You can interact just by simply making comments, doing on-screen markups, and then even with those on-screen types of things, we could just go ahead and save those off as comments. Now, again, these comments live on that data set. So even people that don't have access to the direct SOLIDWORKS data are going to be able to do these types of operations where the users inside of SOLIDWORKS would actually see these comments located over in the information panel inside of their task pane. So once again, a simple click allows us to take a little screen capture, make a little note, and do the information gathering right here on the information instead of in a secondary or tertiary operation like a like a, a text tool like Teams or Slack or in email, which a lot of us old timers have been doing. We need to have all of these multiple data sources and communication sources unified down into one single source. And this very much enables that. Now, all of this data, once again, has the ability to be interacted with with, with users that maybe don't necessarily have CAD tools but their particular tasks within an organization need to move data along, maybe approve it, maybe go ahead and do even a little bit more, which is something we'll, we'll show in just a little bit. But in this case, you know, going ahead and taking ownership, um, again, moving maturity states right within the browser without necessarily needing CAD tools. All right, so that's just a little bit, really, of what SolidWorks with cloud services can do. And there's several other you know, functionalities that we'll kind of just, you know, talk about a little bit more as we go. But essentially, uh, but, but essentially, this is available for every SolidWorks desktop license that's been purchased since July of last year till now. So that's the last nine months of any new SolidWorks desktop license you've purchased. And for those of you who had existing licenses, this can be opted in, which is really kind of where I want to go with this. But there are different ways to actually communicate. And some people don't necessarily need full-on data management, or at least don't think they need it. Actually, for a one-man show, it's just as powerful as it is for a work group. But a lot of people, regardless of the level of, of data management you have internally, sometimes just need to bring in an external collaborator. The question, yes, it does come with standard also. So basically, when we're looking at this, you might just need tools like being able to share with other people and have them do those aforementioned markups, where prior to that, it would require access and some permissions to do this. So if you're somebody who just needs to share data out really quick and do a markup, really, that's just a right click away. So with your desktop license, we've got this tab here called Lifecycle and Collaboration. Now within it, again, there's a lot of those operations I was talking about before. The ability to go ahead and take ownership of data, um, you know, be able to, to release it, reload from server, get different revisions. But down here, we have this little link that enables us to go ahead and share this data externally and a lot of different file types, depending on what we're looking at here as our choices. Now for the data that we've got here, we just simply click share. And it'll launch a very familiar type of thing, because I'm sure that you've seen this in other share tools like OneDrive. I'll, I'll parallel this in a positive way this time. The difference is, is that our sharing operation here is CAD aware. Again, it understands the re relations between part assemblies and drawings. And when those files change, how those trickle down effects take place. It's not the same as the existing share services that you're probably used to using. Now with this, there's a few different ways that we can do it. We can go ahead and restrict it just by giving a few email addresses within this, or we can just copy a link or really kind of an operation of both of those if you want to give people access to this file externally. Now the email address is really the simplest way, of course. Um, that can be anybody within your organization or outside. And frankly, again, this doesn't really require anybody to currently have 3D experience login. That'll be part of the email that they receive. Now we can add a little message to this. Again, it's a real simple way to do this. So I'm gonna send it to myself because if I just send it to Jared here, you're not gonna be able to see this within his email unless he's on with us here. I don't see him on with us. So that's okay. And then we'll just go ahead and throw a really quick message in here. I'm just gonna go ahead and check out, check this out. All right, so very simply from that, let's just go ahead and hit share. 
Now, the share on this one's gonna activate a link that goes for one month. Now, you can update this file. You can go ahead and make a change to it and it will choose to either send a new link or update the existing link. And I also like to enable the guest comments because after all, why not? That's what we put it out there for. Now, it's gonna do a couple of different things for us. Here, it gives me another opportunity within SolidWorks to see that that link has been copied. And then in my interface within SolidWorks, we go over to our 3D drive and we get to see all the data that's been shared externally with anybody. Now, this is where I'm going to be able to see any of the different markups and comments that that user does externally um, as we kind of you know, go full circle with this communication process. Now, the information that we have on this currently is going to show us a few things. Now, right now, I just want to show you that we don't have any comments in this just yet so that you can really, again, see the full arc of this. Now, with this, if I go ahead and take a look at my email, okay, here's the email that we got from that. So now what we have is a simple link. It says my comment, check this out. And it just has a link there that says, go ahead and click this to see more. Yeah, I guess that's pretty good. That's enough. Now, when we go ahead and click this to see more, what we're going to go ahead and do is either if I have a login, which I currently do, it's going to take me right to the data. If you don't have a login, it's going to prompt you to create a free 3D experience login. But that's the one that's going to be persistent from that point on. Now, at this point, I actually tried to log out so that it would be fresh in my cache. And that way, we can go ahead and see what that looks like. But right down there at the bottom, it just says create your account. So easy enough. We're going to go ahead and take this one and I'm just going to log in as who I already am. That's going to, again, kind of verify my credentials and, and what I already have when it comes to my data access on my corporate Go Engineer tenant. But for any user, it just takes you to a 3D experience browser tab. And in this case, it's going to have our universal 3D play viewer. Now, the 3D play viewer is going to give you some different options depending on the data source that you sent out there. Um, this data source might be one that really was just intended for view and markup, maybe keeping your intellectual property secure, but having somebody to be able to collaborate within this process. So within our tools along the bottom, like you saw before, we have some nice markup tools, but also some built-in explode tools. Whether this had an explode view in the SOLIDWORKS file or not, it actually does it automatically, which is pretty fun in either way. Just a little added benefit uh, to this type of interaction. Now, along with that, users can measure, they can do section views, we can do all kinds of great stuff down here at the bottom, like I said. And within those section views and other types of things there, there's some interaction as far as pushing and pulling on the planes, and again, changing the angle of attack here when it comes to how we might want to look at this particular data. Graphical triads, these things are universal. I think you're going to see them in every platform tool that we ever show you. And frankly, they've been around since the beginning of things like exploded views and a lot of the tools that we have within SOLIDWORKS anyway. Okay, now within, within this file, again, if we do a little bit of a markup here, let me go ahead and show you the full circle on this one. One of the communication processes really might just be with a customer and says, okay, Mr. Customer, this is what it looks like. Tell me what you think. Well, they just go ahead and throw a little bit of an on-screen um, markup there and just a very simple note. This is enough maybe from this angle in order to go ahead and get that point across. So maybe we just want a larger capacity battery. All right, well, down on the taskbar here, we're just going to go ahead and say create a uh, comment. And with that comment, it's just going to go ahead and slide open our sideboard bar and take that screen capture. Now, although at this point, it looks like any typical comment that you might see from, you know, any typical type of interaction like this, it is quite a bit more than that. And again, I'm going to do this myself here just so you can see the full loop. But I put a comment in with this basic screenshot. Now, back in SolidWorks, it's going to cache a little bit here. It takes about five seconds to refresh on my system. But if we go ahead and take a look at the comments, let's see what we got. Yeah, okay, there it is. Now, the comment itself isn't just a screen capture. It's got the information that I typed, but when the user on the other end actually goes ahead and clicks on that, and even in this case, it's going to go ahead and click on it, it's going to launch inside of the viewer, in this case, directly inside of the SOLIDWORKS task pane. Now, the orientation that those comments were put in is very important. So it's going to open up in that particular orientation. As I start to rotate this around a little bit, those might become less and less persistent. But if I click on them, that's going to go ahead and snap me directly into those orientations because that's important. The orientation it was in when those comments were put in is germane to what it's pointing to. So it is more than just a screenshot. It is actual full interactive 3D still with measurement, markup, section, and all the other tools that you saw available to it. And even the ability to download. If I've enabled this in such a way that the file type is something that that user can you know, get some benefit out of, maybe they go ahead and hit download there. Again, those comments allow me to interact on the data itself instead of having a secondary or tertiary source that maybe isn't common between the organizations that are trying to talk with each other. 
this just keeps it all in this one-stop shopping area. All right, let's kind of move forward a little bit on this. And I'm going to do one more, um, one more share and markup on this one, but just to make it a little bit different here, let's just take a part and open that up in its own window. And this one, I want to do a different file type. And with this, we just simply go ahead and select this different file type from the pull down at the top. Now with that, I want somebody to be able to utilize this. Maybe somebody in machining, maybe it's got some MBD in it. So maybe an AP243 you know, would be a way I'd send this out. But through this particular tool here, we want to go ahead and save it as a step file, which is going to be not only interactive in the same way, but also something that the user can download and then go ahead and put it right into a machining application if that's the communication purpose to a third party vendor, um, somebody that can go ahead and do this machining process for us. We're just gonna do a quick way here. I'll copy this to an external. And with that, I'm just gonna toggle over to a web browser and uh, we'll go ahead and paste that. There we go. I sent a link to myself too, so we can go through that way. But basically what we've got is the same type of interaction. The difference here is that in the upper right-hand corner, we're going to expose this as usable data um, instead of more just interactive, viewable, lighter data, uh, depending on, again, who we needed to deal with. But one thing I didn't do on the other one here was show you a little bit of the measuring tools as well, which, you know, really we're talking about a 3D XML file here. So it's all very graphical, very light. But as you're touching off on different entities, whether they're endpoints, whether they're radii, um, you know, center points, vertices, vertexes, um, we're having these different types of web-based tools for those users who, again, don't necessarily have CAD and can't control their own destiny otherwise. A quick click in the upper right-hand corner, whoops, going to download that one, and that's going to give you your step file. All right, so the current picture, what this looks like, as I mentioned, is that as of July of last year, July 1st, right in the middle of the year, everything that is a new purchase of a SOLIDWORKS desktop license has cloud services. So you'll see a small uptick in the price, you know, not going to hide that. There's about $324 difference in the license, but it gives you this out of the box access. Again, with very low IT resources necessary, you're saving things to the cloud and you're accessing data and sharing right there once we get it installed. Now, it requires a couple of base roles technologically. These are just roles that give you access to all the viewer tools, navigation tools, and file access tools. And then it also goes ahead and puts a little bit of a sidebar inside of SOLIDWORKS, which is your connector, your collaborative designer for SOLIDWORKS. That's really all it takes. Um, your new SOLIDWORKS licenses are gonna have this by nature and anything that you get that you need to upgrade, we will go ahead and walk you through the process of getting into, um, getting that into your software if necessary. So everything you just saw is absolutely part of every new SOLIDWORKS license. And that includes the share and markup. Um, it really is a great way to uh, even people who are using desktop PDM and are very devoted and, and invested in that. Share and markup is still a fantastic tool for being able to send this data outside without those extra attachments and emails and other, you know, kind of disconnected type of communication methods. For existing SOLIDWORKS desktop licenses, that 27 you know, years worth of data that we've had out there and files that have been with longtime customers, you just simply have to opt in or can opt in on renewal. Um, you don't have to. But it really is a wealth of uh, capabilities that we're really just touching the tip of right now. But again, we'll kind of expound upon that as we go a little bit more here. All right, seeing my guys over here in the chat and Eric and Todd for sure, they're catching all my, um, some intentional funds, but you know, we get into all kinds of stuff here when we get into these nerdy types of topics. So we love our job here. Funds are just kind of second nature to us. Okay, that really covers cloud services, and there is more to it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about with these kind of worlds of solutions beyond, because as I mentioned before, the platform itself really has a lot of capabilities above and beyond just being a CAD repository. Really, that's kind of the lowest common denominator of the whole thing. Um, you're going to find out that there are a lot of other people within your company that have tasks that maybe you're not even aware of that could also benefit from the same data set. And those departments are hemorrhaging when it comes to unifying the communication process. So you might have your stuff together in engineering, but everybody within the company needs to touch that data because it's the lifeblood of everything you do right from sales out to procurement and product production and, and sending it to a customer. So it is an important thing. And that's why I want to kind of pivot a little bit here to where you can go from here. Now, the advantages of 3D experience, as I've mentioned and peppered throughout this presentation, I want to be a little bit more formal about these particular benefits. 
And I've said it a lot, and I don't mean to disparage on IT people because IT people are superheroes. They just have better things to do than be the administrator of an SQL database and make sure that data is backed up just in case the world ends. And we really are living in a time where with entrepreneurs and with, with um, you know, startups where IT is very much pay to play. We have IT services and every time we pick up the phone, we have to you know, pay them for that. And that gives people, unfortunately, the, the hesitation of calling IT when they need them instead of just having them on site at a constant you know, um, expense. So little to no IT is a very important part of this. And I'm not kidding. Again, I can't say it enough because really what you're dealing with is you know, desktop traditional, you're dealing with licensing. That's what you guys see. That's what the users see. When it doesn't work, that's when everybody knows about it. What IT sees is all of this stuff. And let me tell you, they are there on nights and weekends. They are doing things that you don't even understand in order to make sure that the company moves along smoothly. And they're dealing with that hardware. They're dealing with the backups and hopefully a backup that's timely enough for when the data is, you know, lost, which generally that's always a, a crapshoot as well. But it's what they have to do with backups and security patches and just making sure that access is free and clear for everybody that needs it, but not wide open that somebody from outside gets it and shouldn't. When we're talking about the 3D experience, yes, licensing is there, but you really don't see a whole lot of anything else. We help you configure it. We train you how to use it. But it's about simply getting that on your platform, showing you how to assign roles to people, and then everybody's off and running with their capabilities. Now, that's really why this is great, because it is incredibly scalable. Now, scalability can look like a double-edged sword, so I want to talk about this a little bit as well. The product can grow very much with you, though. We can just start with what you've seen today, and once you're comfortable with that, we add another role or another functionality into it, and that's where you can go with this. So scalability really comes down to, once again, historically, SolidWorks has always been very comfortable as far as order administration is concerned. There's three licenses, standard, professional, premium, and those licenses are bundles. So they're real easy. They come with a bunch of functionality and you kind of pick one of those three, whether it's a local install, whether it's a network install, whether it's you know going to be something now that you can have from the cloud, that's a different thing. And then when you have 50 seats, usually an admin image is a great way to help pollinate those hardware you know, licenses. Otherwise, you've got to you know, go like a bee from one computer to another with media and install software. That is really what SolidWorks has looked like to this point. When we're talking about the platform, we take those IT heavy tasks and we really just kind of automate those. Um, it's a matter of you having the licensing necessary for the people at your company. And again, buying only exactly what you need for everybody. I can't express that enough. The licenses follow you wherever I log in. If I go to a computer I've never been to and I log into the platform and I click that SolidWorks logo, it actually downloads and installs SolidWorks on that computer. The license follows me. And then of course, I've got my data there because I have access. To the platform. It is actually quite incredible when you let it do what it's really good at. Now, the updates are automatic. And this is a little bit of one of those things where the, the, the audience that is comfortable with waiting until Service Pack 3 is going to have to come to grips with things move way faster than that these days. Now, I'm going to say that in kind of a way where you're not going to have as much control over Service Pack updates when it comes to updating at least SolidWorks if you're using platform SolidWorks. For those of you on desktop SolidWorks, you kind of chug along exactly the same way you are, and two years worth of old SolidWorks will work with the platform as well. But as far as my SolidWorks goes, I get updates, I hit a button, it's done, and I'm on the latest service pack without even really thinking about it. And if they find a bug, I have a hot fix instantly. It's something that can really be taken care of in a much more immediate way. So I'm growing with SolidWorks in these immediate automatic updates. As far as the platform tools are concerned, though, again, we know how our updates happen. You look at your phone, Facebook looks different today. You don't care about that. It's just updated. That's the way the world is going. So we need to go ahead and get on board with that. But what it does offer is we don't need IT people to do these updates. It happens automatically. It's based on your credentials logging in, and you just don't need to have the server resources. It's just done. So if Dassault takes care of those and the servers are peppered all over the world. I mentioned you have a job to do, but you may not know that everybody else has a different job to do, and those jobs all culminate in the success of any organization. Now, I'm a CAD guy, so I kind of have tunnel vision when it comes to the engineering department. 
And those engineering guys are making 3D parts. That's great. And those 3D parts turn into bill materials, which somehow magically turn into product and get shipped to customers, at least as far as maybe some of the CAD guys are concerned. However, in a bigger organization, you got electrical people doing that. You might even have people doing right down to the printed circuit boards. All of those require separate engineering bill of materials. Now, once you've got that, okay, great. Now we need the M-bomb because your CAD quantities aren't necessarily taking into account all that stuff that has to be in the box before this thing ships, which are going to be documentation and fluids and you know other things that we don't model. Documentation, okay, there you go. You got an owner's manual, you got a service guide, you've got something that is required before a product ships, especially if it's a consumer good and before it goes on the shelf at Home Depot there, you got to have that owner's manual and all the other documents inside. These are things that are necessary to the entire planning of this project right up into release of it. And there's a lot of other people in the company that are feeding these subsystems. You all know it, you all know it. Now I realize what this starts to look like after a while. But the reality is, is ideas come in, customers, you know, pay you for something and it gets produced and it goes out the back and everybody somehow gets together to make this happen. And what the 3D experience platform does is it gives you the tools individual for everybody's necessary roles and tasks within the company. Now, again, you don't have all these roles yourself. Hopefully not. That's a pretty, uh, you know, heady type of, uh, you know, stress and, and responsibility you've got. But these tools exist for the people that need them. And the platform really kind of puts these in a place where you can just, again, pick and grow with what you need. And everything is still based on the same data. So as you pull in another place, you maybe pull in some machining or get into some rendering and marketing or other things, robot programming, all of those use the same data that you're already storing on the platform. So you're really setting yourself up for growth right from day one without necessarily having to go ahead and swallow the entire pig to get a little bit of the bacon to start. Now, thus far, you've really only seen 3D design. That's kind of where we've done this, is kind of the perspective of a SolidWorks user and, again, cloud services. But I want to kind of go another direction there, as I mentioned, which was the next logical step. And that's getting that full, rich bill of materials out of the product, as opposed to just the CAD bill of materials that we can get from SolidWorks through a variety of right-click, save-as operations. So I'm going to move in to one of two more things here before we end up looking at the time here, we're gonna be starting, uh, going right up until the top of the hour. So we'll be finishing perfect. We're gonna go ahead and get into a little bit more complete bill materials management. Because like I said, the CAD bill materials with quantities, that's great, but that just gets us started. Now, historically within a company, we really have to do this in some very, very, you know, kind of, they're smart tools. Excel is a smart tool, I get that. Um, but there's a lot of where people's fingers touch the keyboard, and anytime that happens, there's a chance for error. So historically, it is very minutia, very, very detailed and tedious. And again, Excel and other tools like that are, are the ones we rely on. When it comes to the platform, we give a person the tool they need for this complete bill of materials access. And once again, they don't need to know SOLIDWORKS to be able to do these types of things. They can just finish their process as they need to using the release engineer role that we have. Now, what's great about that is they can actually change, not dimensions on, but they can change the structure of CAD files with the access to the data, but not necessarily within a CAD tool, which prior to this is kind of unfounded. And they even have the ability to go ahead and kind of finish things out, which is what you're gonna really see here in this uh, example. So let's get a little bit into this and account for every item in the bottom or box with the, uh, the bill materials management. This is our product release engineer role. Now, again, it's on the platform, so I'm in a desktop tab here, and I've got a tab that I've built up specifically for build materials management. And when I click on that, I've got my engineering release tool and I've got a viewer basically available at me. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and just use the data we just put up on the platform, which is this jigsaw. And what you see here is really more or less based on that CAD bill of materials. Now, the status, the maturity state of this data is here, even the lock status, who owns this information is here. But on top of all of that, we've also got basic metadata like description. There's a neat thumbnail there. And then there's this concept called CAD master, which I'll talk about a little bit more as we go. Now, as a release engineer, again, I might not know CAD, might not even have access to a license because, you know, we don't really want to pay for our full SOLIDWORKS license for these peripheral functions. But here I can finish by actually modifying the CAD data, doing things like a little slow double click inside the description field and finishing out where maybe just, you know, a hardworking and, and you know, rapidly trying to kick out data engineer maybe just missed this little piece of metadata. No harm, no foul, but we need to go ahead and make sure it's clean and clear before we save this out. So there I'm simply finishing it up by adding descriptions that maybe were missed. 
Now, some other interesting functions that we have within the software are also serializing tools. Now, I really like to do these as my enterprise item number. Um, some people like to serialize the actual file numbers, but with this, I can choose our counter, which is a random six digit code that's going to apply in this case to parts, the MCH or machined part code, but it allows us to go ahead and serialize and give us just that other layer of searchability and metadata um, that gives a unique identifier to every single part that we do. Now this can be done inside of SOLIDWORKS as you go, but if it's missed, great, release engineer is gonna take care of that and make sure that each and every one of these that was missed maybe gets their necessary enterprise item number. Now these types of tools, once again, they usually require physical read write access to the data. And that's the magic of the platform is that even though this data was created in SOLIDWORKS indicated by the CAD master, this person has rights to the data, therefore they can make these modifications to it, even though it wasn't opened up, changed and saved from within SOLIDWORKS. Again, quite magical. Now, the viewer is great here too, because it's bi-directional. As I start to click things in my viewer, my line items are gonna go ahead and show up over there in my build materials. And it's just a nice little interaction when it comes to those kinds of things. Now, other data might be necessary um, for this particular um, package. You know, we wanna make sure that we've got everything in the box accounted for. So we can go ahead and, uh, and you know, show that we really just have the bill materials or for the, the CAD file currently, but we can add things to this. Now, this isn't necessarily for the bill materials yet, but for a structure that maybe needs more data. The release engineer here can add existing data or add new files to this right through this interface. Again, not doing this inside of the CAD operation, but inside of our release engineer role. So with this one here, I'm gonna go ahead and just say new product. Now product is our, our terminology for assembly, but it gives me the access to put in a new blank file using my SOLIDWORKS assembly templates that we have loaded to the platform. Same thing that you'd see when you say file new within your SOLIDWORKS application. Now, assembly is one way we could do this. Maybe I have to structure a sub-assembly that we uh, have yet to design, but is necessary for this. Or we can just insert a brand new blank part. Once again, all my new part file templates are available to us as we insert this new blank, but data based on an existing SOLIDWORKS part template. We can throw a little name on that. It gives us some serialized names as we go with our physical products. But for this one here, let's just go ahead and call that SOLIDWORKS part. And then good, looking good. We'll go ahead and hit create. And as you can see from my bill of materials here, from my version C of my jigsaw assembly, we now have that new SOLIDWORKS part at the bottom based on a SOLIDWORKS template, which means the SOLIDWORKS CAD master is adhered to. So it knows that this is SOLIDWORKS native data, even though it was never opened in SOLIDWORKS as of yet. Again, quite magical. Now, other things that we can do with this is we can add existing data, either through the pull-down menus or through my search. Now, my search allows me to type anything I know about data, and it will find it regardless of where it exists. Name, properties, description, material, doesn't matter. All that metadata is there. And a simple drag and drop allows me to drop this into my structure. Now, I am adding one SOLIDWORKS assembly to another SOLIDWORKS assembly, and I'm doing it without SOLIDWORKS. You see my viewer has updated and everything here looks fantastic as a result of that. It really, again, is something that really we're relegated to actually having to have the CAD tool to make this happen. Now I can upload data. Data in general is any document type. Once again, everybody within the company can use this tool. For the data I wanna add here, it's gonna be a simple PDF file. So let's just go ahead and throw a little bit of a tweaked version of this owner's manual which is regarded as a document on the site, but will still be a PDF through and through as far as that goes. So we're uploading a new fresh document, and then that new fresh document is gonna go ahead and also be added to this structure right here at the bottom. All right, looks good. And then let's go ahead and take that new document and let's drop it into our viewer. Simple drag and drop, drag and drop everywhere on the platform. And their universal viewer pretty much looks at any type of file you're going to put up there. So a little PDF here, user guide for my jigsaw. All right. So that being said, we also have to get data out of this tool. So we've now structured an assembly that now has a PDF underneath it, as well as really another SOLIDWORKS assembly that's been added to the structure, as well as a blank SOLIDWORKS file. Now with that, we need to now go ahead and export the data. So through a little bit of a higher level menu here, we're gonna go ahead and just kick this data out. Also, right on this menu is gonna be all those other functions we can do when it comes to branching and merging and maturity states and all those great built-in data management functions that your cloud services has. But here, we're gonna go ahead and first export a CSV file, how we export data. Now the CSV file is going to give you an Excel-based type of document. So of course, we go ahead and click that 
And that's going to mirror the levels and layers that we have in this exact structure that we see of the assembly we've created here in Engineering Release Manager. So we go ahead and open this up in our own window and just click on the Excel file and it'll go ahead and pop up in Excel here. So the structures, the columns, um, here's my part that I've added as well as the assembly that we dropped in place. All of that stuff is now added to this rich output, which can be consumed by any downstream product or MRP or ERP system or front office um, you know, order management system. That's really what the purpose of this formatting is. What we also have is the ability to go ahead and once again, without access to a CAD system necessarily, the ability to export this CAD data in a package. Now it's a lot like pack and go, only this pack and go is much bigger than even what we see in SOLIDWORKS. Here I can go ahead and put my CAD files out, let's put the drawings in, and then let's also add in some step and PDFs for our 3D and 2D files. So we're gonna package all of this stuff together in one output, and it will kick out a nice zip file to wherever we have deemed. Fantastic way to go ahead and be able to package and distribute this data for this person's role within the company, which does not necessarily include design nor the skills or access to SOLIDWORKS. Now, I can release data, I can set it to freeze, which are ways that we can go ahead now and control whether people can take ownership and edit that data, or whether we're waiting for manager, manager approval, or whether this data is being produced and sent to customers. Those maturity states are very nice extra layer that gives us that type of control and visibility. All right, so I got a question over on the side. Um, where's cloud storage located? So the cloud storage is, we'll just say out in the cloud. Um, literally though, there's a couple of servers in the United States, one that's in the Boston area, um, US East, and then US West too, which is out in the LA area. And I think they're spooling up another one locally in the Chicago area for us, at least locally to me. Um, but then there's a handful more that are peppered around the world. So they are basically everywhere. Now, full disclosure on that, we're really not going to, at this point, um, claim to be ITAR compliant because they can't quote unquote guarantee that your data stays on a United States server. Doesn't mean that it doesn't because you're logging into the local and fastest server when you do connect to the platform. So the data is located out there. Um, where it is, is really kind of above my pay grade, but it is accessible anywhere you have that internet connection. All right, the last part of this that I want to show, and maybe this is one of those little pieces that, that kind of makes your company more efficient just by incorporating a little bit more control. And that's going to be collaborative tasks and then potentially project planning. Now, why I sort of mentioned those in two different ways is one of these I refer to as informal and the other one is a little bit more formal. So pick the level that you want to go, but either way, this is going to give you a level of organization that you probably haven't utilized um, within your CAD process to this point. Now, once again, historically, task management and planning has always been based on things like Gantt charts. Now, these Gantt charts can be in a tool like Microsoft Project. Um, you can do those in Excel. I have walked into boardrooms and I have seen these things as 25 foot unrolled pieces of plotter paper on a wall. They're huge. And they show you everything that is supposed to happen based on everything else that's supposed to happen, or at least what everybody thinks happens. And that's kind of where these things get very difficult, especially when they're hard papered on a wall. But with a 3D experience platform, the person who needs to actually have this project planning role can do that. However, right out of the box to begin with, collaborative tasks is actually something that exists in your cloud services tools. So the stuff that you've already got that goes with the things we began this presentation with, this particular next part that I want to show you is also something that you can do right there on day one. So this is part of SOLIDWORKS Cloud Services, and it gives you the ability to create a task, assign and attach data to it, and then have some sort of upward user interface so you can see the status of that task. Now, if we want to go a little bit more active, now we're going to control this with a physical timeline. And again, that becomes things with dependencies where one task ends and another task begins or is, is, is uh, started off. And we need statistics. This stuff requires an additional role called the project planner. And again, only the person who needs that particular UI needs to have that role. Everybody else, they just have what they have already, which is your collaborative tasks. So let me show you that. For the last demonstration here, we're gonna get back inside of SOLIDWORKS, but over in our right-hand pane, we're gonna switch this over to our other file. And then I wanna go ahead and just kind of hit my pull down menu at the top and access some of the other apps that I actually have right here from within my 3D experience tab. So we'll update to the latest just so we know that we're on latest and greatest stuff. And then up here at the top, let's just go ahead and hit our pull down. 
That's going to give me access to other apps that I have. Now, currently, the ones that I like to use within this interface are things like the bookmarks editor. Previously, you already saw 3D share and 3D space um, with our 3D play tool. So that's going to be your drive applications. But with this one here, I'm going to go ahead and fire up collaborative tasks. Just another fantastic tool built directly into this tab. Now, this is what we call that, that kind of passive control. We have formal tasks that are here. Now, these tasks are in a particular state. And, you know, as I'm working on this one here, you know, I guess I've got one that's going on right now where I've already created the PowerPoint for this. So I can take that task and move it over to completed. Anybody else that knows about it's going to see that. Well, I'm also presenting for you right now. So let me just go ahead and move my present this presentation over to in work since right now we happen to be doing this. Again, anybody else with visibility is going to understand that that task has now moved along a percentage within its activity. To create a task, though, is very simple, and anybody can do this. When you create a task, we're going to give it a little bit of a title here. So let's go ahead and review this change. And there's a couple of different ways you can define it, but we want to go ahead and make this task and maybe give it a little bit of a description here. So this one here is we're going to go ahead and take a look at this change. Great. Let me know what you think. Now, when we go ahead and create this task, first, it's going to show up in my to-dos, and then it gives me the ability to kind of fill this out a little bit more, give it some more detail. The first thing I'm going to do with this one is just kind of review the fact that it took what I put into that initial interface and it assigned us our rolling task number 192. Now I can up the criticality to this. So if this is a more important than just a basic task, we can go ahead and make that a little bit more critical. It's going to give it a little higher level of visibility. And then if we know a little bit about how long we really have to do it, we can fill this out a couple of different ways. Again, this is a little bit more formal, but not quite controlled. But if we want to just say, okay, this takes a bunch of days, we can say plan start, whatever. We'll go ahead back to January here. And then with the planned end, maybe we're going to give it a couple of weeks. So we just click on the calendar and it gives us this duration. Great. I generally don't do that. I generally just have the amount of days a task will take. So I like to just put an estimated day and we can put some plus or minus there too, but we'll say three days. What really makes this super useful though is again, it is one source of the interaction, one source of the truth. And here in my attachments tab, what I can do is simply go ahead and drag from my SOLIDWORKS pane right over into the attachments. And we're not attaching a copy. We are just attaching the reference to this existing data. Again, one source of the truth, and it lives on the communication element itself. Now, once I've got that done, what I also want to do is assign this to somebody. Now, when I start typing numbers and names here, we're going to get a wild card that pops up after three characters that's going to be anybody that's in my tenants. We're going to go ahead and grab Jared, and I'm just going to go ahead and assign him to this task. Now, along with that, you're actually not going to go ahead and see this if I just assign it to Jared. So let me go ahead and throw myself in there as well. And then from that, I am the owner of this particular task. So um, I'm going to be listed there in the bottom anyway. But once I go ahead and hit save with that, this is going to add the task to my to-do list, which you can see right here at the top. We've got review this change. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at this in the browser. Now, I have another tab, again, for particular works uh, or for, for particular focused work. Then I'm going to go to my project planning, which you can see the exact same user interface here that I see within SOLIDWORKS. So here, because it's fairly instantaneous with the caching, you can see that I can review this change. And again, everything that I listed is on the right-hand side. Criticality, the data is right there. And anybody that's been tagged with this can now hit the pull down and open or preview this data with whatever tools they have available based on their roles. Now, if it's just somebody with a viewer, well, they can open it up and measure and mark up and communicate. And that's fantastic. If it's somebody that's been tasked with this, it's actually a CAD um, access user, then they can open it up in their CAD system and make changes. So we really have the ability to use whatever that recipient has access to and not necessarily need to know that on the front end. Now with this, I can move the change over and Jerry will be aware of it as well as it's going to show up different on my timeline. And this just gives more visibility as to the status of a particular project, percentage, complete, and it's going to really kind of feed into the statistics. So this, what you see here, is part of cloud services. Again, the main part of this entire presentation and what every license of new SOLIDWORKS has for the last nine months. If you need a little bit more formal, then that individual or those few individuals within your company would also want to have the project planning capabilities. That's going to allow us to take all these tasks and amplify their, their um, visibility here using more of a chart, more of an actual Gantt chart or a calendar. Now, what you're seeing at this point here is exactly the same type of tasks. We're just throwing those on a calendar so that they have these types of visibilities and, and milestones. 
So the same little plus button that I went ahead and used inside of SOLIDWORKS is how we do it here. Whether I'm making a new project or a milestone, or like I said, the task that we just did before. When we create this new task, it's exactly the same process. I give it a name. Let's go ahead and type in some stuff here. We'll make this test print. Did this presentation for 3D Experience World, so this is good. And then we can give it a little bit of a description here if we need to. Um, not necessary, but we can go ahead and do that. Now, what we also have is the same type of assignment. So I can assign this to myself just for convenience sake here, and we'll give it a number of days. So this is, again, a little bit more formal and heads up than the, um, the more um, passive tasks. Now, I'm dealing with a top-level project and sub-projects here. So this task went by default on the project that I'm actually working in, which is my 3D Experience World 2024 project. However, I can edit this pretty easily and drop it to a different parent just by typing a little bit of that. And again, the wildcard is going to do that search for me. So we'll drop this down and maybe change on the timeline where this task is. What I can also do is change the duration through these little drag handles, as well as make a dependency just by dragging from the end of one or the beginning of one to the end of another. What that now means is as I finish this task, that now fires off the next task. And if this task gets kicked down the road a little bit and actually takes longer, that other one is also going to get pushed out further and further all feeding the metrics of the burn down rate we're dealing with here. Now, like I said, these are, you know, sub projects inside a top level project, but here on top of just a graphical interface, we have statistics. Now that's going to let us know the status of all the tasks we have in this, as well as the sub projects. And again, shows us our burn down rate that at the current trajectory, we should be able to finish this project. And then how many people have this? Again, it's not very exciting looking because it's only Jared and I on this, but it really gives you that dashboard that a lot of people are craving for to be able to see where the status of everything actually is, not just you know have a repository that stores this data. Dependencies are those little drag and drop handles that I brought. So one thing ends, another thing starts, and again, one gets kicked down the road, the other has to push out as well. But that is real life, and we need to know what things rely on others. And this is a very, very simple way to connect those. Now, I'm the only member of this, but I can go ahead and assign these tasks to anybody that I feel like. Anybody else that's a member, they can actually go ahead and administrate these as well. Now here, as I mentioned, these are sub-projects. So each of these projects has the capability to be controlled by a different person. So if you have somebody in your organization that is actually managing each of these three individual projects on their own, and then me at the top level, I have them as sub-projects, well, then each of these can be managed by an individual person with a much less cluttered and more focused dashboard. And then I'll see at the top level exactly what those you know, particular type of adjacent projects are doing and, you know, kind of where everything on the top level stands. It's a great tool, once again, for the people in the organization that need this type of visibility. But we only get it for the person that needs this. Once again, you buy only exactly the roles you need for the people within your company. And we're here to go ahead and, and kind of, uh, you know, figure that out, do the discovery and recommend to you the, the best and most efficient way to go ahead and cover all those people's roles. So once again, historically, this takes a lot of very manual tasks, even if it's electronic, whether it's a computer or whether it's paper on a wall. We really make this kind of, again, a one-stop shopping place where everything is in this unified 3D experience platform. And regardless of who the individual is that's interacting with these particular projects, they're going to have the necessary access that they need individually based on what they do in the company um, on top of that. So whether it's a CAD user, somebody in management, somebody in procurement, sales, um, you know, those people are going to get exactly what they need in order to collaborate properly. So like I said, this world of solutions beyond has a lot of capabilities for people that maybe you're doing something that you're not aware of within the organization, but the platform takes all of these. And since it's based off the exact same data models, it gives you the ability to connect these immediately um, just by adding capabilities through new roles and growing with the product. Okay, so I see people putting in a few questions over on the right-hand side. I'm going to go ahead and look at those a little bit here and see what we've got on the Q&A. Um, so go ahead and type those over on the side as we go, and we'll finish this up a little bit here as well. So I saw Eric Beatty says, does STEP AP242 sharing require you to have a seat of MBD or 242 export as benefit? Um, this tool here is not going to have 242 access. Um, you actually have to have some of those MBD tools either within the platform or with SOLIDWORKS to actually save that file, Eric. So I think that you know that with, with MBD, it's a bolt-on to pretty much anything with SOLIDWORKS as an additional application. Um, on the platform, there are tools that do this type of 3D markup, um, but those are the ones that are going to have the drive format output for this. I uh, can't do that as the release engineer within this tool. 
unless I have derived format converter and the capability to put that file type out. So that's one of the Q and A's that we have there for Eric. I'm gonna go back over to the chat. Um, okay, thanks for clarifying. Uh, you're welcome, Eric, anytime. Thanks for attending, uh, you and Todd and everybody else out there that's interacting. Hey, Adam. Uh, anybody else have any questions while we're going with this? I should have asked the first question here, which is, yeah, are you guys still awake? <laughs> so that was for doing this live, but I think with everybody here, you're all uh, keeping yourselves interacting here. All right, I'll keep this open for a couple more minutes. Um, got another question out there. Let's see what we got. Is there any way to also have a local backup in case you don't have an internet connection? Okay, J Jacob, um, when you edit whatever, interact with the data, um, it copies it to a local workspace. So the SOLIDWORKS data, pretty much any data that you're working with that you've checked out or owner, got ownership of, is in some place. By default, it's on your C drive under your user directory. There's a, a pretty deep path for it, but it's a 3D experience, my work folder. So the data you have literally is local. Um, the tools have uh, work offline modes. So if the data is sitting local and you didn't have an internet connection, what you're working on is sitting here anyway. Now, I'm gonna expound upon that a little bit more. My SOLIDWORKS is licensed from the platform. So as far as it goes as a user, I literally click on the platform and I click my SOLIDWORKS logo and that launches my local SOLIDWORKS. But what that essentially does is does the handshake with the license. Now it'll do that from time to time and look for that license and it'll let me know if I've lost my internet connection. Um, but I never have a problem with my data. And if I have lost my internet connection at some point, I'll have the ability to save it before dropping SOLIDWORKS out completely. But either way, with a local SOLIDWORKS license, so that's gonna be activated with a serial number, um, it could be a floating license on a network, those are traditional desktop licenses. You're really just working on data in a repository and on a proactive function, you're right-clicking and pushing up a revision or pulling a revision to or from the platform. So internet connections are necessary to you know, get that initial handshake, grab data, pull it out. Um, and the more stable, of course, the better but they're not a, 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 a you know going to break you if you're in the middle of something and you have a you know momentary dropout or things like that um okay so the question is is so that eliminates the solidworks network server need desktop solidworks still has a solidworks server license and that's going to be the same type of thing there's a port that we open up and there's access to it from outside um, and it's basically just a go no go switch when you launch a seed of SOLIDWORKS. Those still exist for companies that either are currently using them or that it makes sense for. 3D Experience SOLIDWORKS essentially is the cloud licensing. Um, it, it's more or less what we used to have back in the day when we had the online license mode. If you logged into your, your My SOLIDWORKS account, um, that is really what this is and kind of why that doesn't exist anymore, frankly. So yes, um, for this particular tool, and I'm gonna go a little deeper into this, but I click on this little guy down here called the launcher. That's my 3D experience launcher. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna take me directly to my platform. That's how that always works. So again, here's my login and here's my password. And then with that, this is how I start my day. I go to the platform. There's my handshake with my licensing. From there, I'm gonna go ahead and click on my roles on the right-hand side. And my roles are gonna go ahead and give me whatever capabilities I have within the system. And again, as a, a pretty rich user within our company, I have quite a few roles here. Uh, but what I like to do is I like to take my, you know, blinding eye chart worth of roles, and I like to break those down into really just are what my favorite things. So our favorite apps that we have here. And I literally go ahead and click SOLIDWORKS. Oh, there's my OD over there. I think somebody commented on that, but that's my OD that I created in X shape, which is a cloud CAD tool, totally different webinar. But I literally click on this SOLIDWORKS connected tool and it's launching SOLIDWORKS. Um, I have an old desktop license behind me on another laptop, which I use my design with SOLIDWORKS tool. That's for desktop SOLIDWORKS. But here you see it's launching my SOLIDWORKS. If I was on a computer that didn't have SOLIDWORKS, of course, it's going to take a few minutes to download because it's about a 12 to 16 gig package. But it literally downloads and installs without asking me many questions because I'm licensed. I'm logged in. My credentials are accurate. So that's a floating license, essentially, that is our 3D experience SOLIDWORKS. Now, the reason I don't really talk about that very much is because it's 3D experience SOLIDWORKS. It already has cloud services based on the nature of the tool that it is. Yes, my graphics card is certified and it's a screamer. But the point is, is this is still a locally installed version of SOLIDWORKS, hardware-wise, functionality-wise, again, video card bus speed, resource utilization-wise. However, my default is to go ahead and save to the platform. And I have the capabilities of uh, you know, choosing to save locally if I want to. 
um, we always have that capability or pushing to the platform when I choose to. That is a long answer to a simple question of, does this eliminate the SolidWorks network server? But thanks, Todd. Uh, too funny. Um, okay, that looks like, I think we've got everything covered with that. Very good, okay. All right, so with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and close this meeting out. For those of you who are still with me, we've got 17 still watching. I appreciate you going over um, on this information with us and keep the questions coming. We cannot talk about this enough until each one of you have the aha moment that it took me a while to have. Um, but once I got over the uncomfortability or the newness of an interface, which we do with any app we download on our phone eventually, I really got into the benefits of what this does for me as a lifetime, lifelong, dedicated SOLIDWORKS user. So um, I'm starting to reap the benefits. And, you know, it's one of those things where I see the future and the future is bright. And uh, we really do have a lot of capabilities. You just have to choose to explore them a little bit with us and we can show you what uh, what you don't know about what you don't know with this uh, really kind of immense ecosystem that we have. Send me questions afterwards. Um, we're gonna have the, uh, the webinar up on the web here eventually. But if you come up with a question after we sign off here, please go ahead and email me directly and uh, we can go ahead and do that. Um, or you can just send something directly through our support ticket line there at uh, goengineer.com. With that, I just wanna say thank you to absolutely every single one of you for uh, spending an hour plus with me today. Um, one of my things about this is the last thing I want to do is ever waste anybody's time. And I know that it's, you know, not an inexpensive um, room to have a group of people here. And literally time is our most important commodity. So once again, I do very much appreciate it. Reach out to me if you have any other questions or you want to dive deeper into anything that you saw here today. With that, thank you very much. Have a great day. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.